Please open your Bibles to Exodus, Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14, our lesson this evening will be taken from that passage. Before I start, I, I want to give a, as a segue here, I want to give a, a, a shout out uh, to um, uh, a couple of brothers who are responsible for security here uh, at the um, a congregation for the building and the grounds. Believe it or not, there are some uh, men in the congregation who uh, take care of that uh, for us. Uh, several of them, but two in particular that you see often in the foyer. One is uh, James Pinot and the other is uh, John uh, Wright. And uh, they make sure that our building is safe and secure, no intruders. We have a lot of entrances here and there's been times when strangers just wander in somehow. So they're always making sure that the hallways are clear and safe. And they also keep an eye on the parking lot because church parking lots are an easy target for thieves. You know, they know that the people who are on the inside, they're going to be there for a while. And it has been known that uh, people's cars have been broken into while they were at church. So they also keep an eye on our parking situation. And you know, if we have a, a big crowd and people have to park in different places, they and some of the people that work with them um, uh, work that. Um, another thing that uh, James especially uh, does, we were talking a little while back, and that is about uh, preparing an evacuation and a rescue plan in case of a fire or tornado, some sort of emergency. You know, it's not easy to evacuate three, four hundred people out of a building safely if something were to take place, an emergency of some kind. Uh, so I want to just uh, mention that uh, a lot of people don't even know uh, why they're there and uh, some of the work that they do. And it also gives me a segue into my lesson tonight entitled Moses' Rescue Plan. Moses' Rescue Plan because I want to talk about another kind of evacuation or rescue plan. One used by Moses when the Israelites faced their own Emergency situation, see how that fits, how nice that, that just fits right in there, doesn't it? I didn't know how I'd get into that, but. Uh. Now the difference, of course, is that Moses' plan was designed by God. You know, for our plan, you know, perhaps some of the elders, myself, will talk about what the best way to evacuate the building, but Moses' plan was designed by God, and, and it could still be used today when we face personal and spiritual, emotional emergencies, in the middle of our everyday lives. Now, I think most of us are familiar with the story of Israel's slavery in Egypt for four centuries, and then God sends Moses uh, to lead them out of this slavery. Now, the Bible also says that God sent the, you know, the plagues on the Egyptians in order to pressure the Pharaoh to release the Jews. Certainly learned all about that in Bible class. We know that after the angel of death came over the land, killing every firstborn, but sparing the Jewish firstborn, the king or the Pharaoh finally relented and he, he allowed the, the Israelites to leave. And in Exodus, we, we read how Moses led the Jews out of Egypt into the desert toward the uh, promised land. Now in Exodus chapter 12, we learn that once the Israelites had camped near the Red Sea, well, the Pharaoh changed his mind about their release and he decided to pursue them anyways with his army. Eventually pinning the people against the water in what seemed to be an impossible situation. And so the Israelites seeing themselves trapped between drowning in the sea on one side and, a, and an angry murderous army on the other, they began to cry out to Moses in utter despair. Now Moses' answer to them at this particular moment was the epitome of faith in God and trust in His mighty power. When seemingly trapped by his enemies, Moses said the following words to the people, words that are recorded in Exodus chapter 14, beginning in verse 13. Moses says the following, it says, but Moses said to the people, do not fear, Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord which He will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Of course, 
We know the familiar ending to this story where Moses, uh, through the power of God, obviously parts the sea and then the people walk across to safety on the, on the other side. We read further on that when the Egyptians tried to follow, when the army tried to follow them, the sea then returned to its natural state and the complete army is killed. Now, we think that this is a, a, a great Bible story to tell our children, and so it is. Or uh, uh, isn't that a, a wonderful thing for a movie to make? You know, I like what uh, Marty said the other day, you know, a 700 page book about witches and goblins, you know, Hollywood gets perfect to all the details. You know, six chapters out of Genesis, nothing. They can't get anything right. But it, it is this, this, this great story of deliverance. You know, it's, it's popular because it's so dramatic, isn't it? We, we've acted it out, we've uh, done VBS on it, and so on and so forth. But it's also an episode that can apply to us in our daily life. It's a very practical thing if you kind of look at it from that perspective. Because our enemies, they may not be foreign armies pursuing us, although this is not an impossible scenario, but for most of us, we don't have an army chasing us. Usually our armies are emotional problems or relationship issues. Our enemies are usually serious illness or accidents, perhaps even financial woes. Our enemies are addictions and sinful desires and habits. Those are the things that have us pinned, if you wish, against the wall. These are the type of things that pursue and sometimes trap us into feeling that there's no way out. You ever have that feeling in your life? There's just no way out. When this happens, it would do us well to listen carefully to Moses' admonition to his people because the God that he relied on to save him and those people is exactly the same God that we have today to rely on and save us. Same power is at work. So when the enemy, whoever or whatever it is, has us pinned down, let's try to follow Moses' rescue plan before we give up. And it's pretty simple, it's recorded right here in these two verses if you, if you look carefully enough. First step of his plan, he says in verse 13, do not fear. So Moses' rescue plan, step one, don't be afraid. Fear is what paralyzes us, isn't it? Now, the way that fear works is that we begin to imagine all the bad things that may happen to us in 10 seconds from now, or 10 days from now, or 10 years from now. You know, it's always in the future, remember? Because nobody ever fears the past. <laughs> it's always the future we fear. Even five seconds ahead of time, that's where the fear is. Projecting into the future like this is what stokes the fire, and the fire of fear is quite debilitating for many people. They can't move, they can't do anything. Now we know that sometimes the things that we fear the most, the worst case scenarios, many times those things don't really happen. Now not always, you know, and not even the majority of times, but, but sometimes the things we fear you know, do come true, but the majority of times the things that we're afraid of don't actually happen in the way that we think about them. In any case, Moses says, don't be afraid. Why? Because God will, and I like the word, He'll fight for you. He's not just standing there saying, yeah, whoa, you're in a hard place, aren't you? How does that feel? You no, know, he says that our God will fight for us. Our God is in our corner. Many times, you know, our thinking, when we're thinking about God, especially when we're in trouble, is that He's against us, that He's out to get us, that He's punishing us, and that He'll never help us because we've messed up, or by, for whatever reason, we're, we're trapped in this corner here. And Moses says exactly the opposite. Stop being afraid. God is going to fight for you. He's in, he's in your corner. What we fear most, of course, is death. But we know that if it comes to that, God will fight to preserve our soul against Satan's attack. 
and God Himself will lead us to the promise that He's made to us, and that is eternal life. So step one in the rescue plan, don't be afraid. And, and you know what, I, I want to change that a little bit, not to don't be afraid, because sometimes it's just hard to not be afraid, but don't give in to fear. Don't let it paralyze you. Don't allow it to overwhelm you. Remember, the things that you fear are usually where? In the future somewhere. And I want to ask you something. Who controls the future? Only God controls the future. Moses' rescue plan also requires us to stand firm. You know, it says, do not fear, or Moses says in Exodus 14, 13, do not fear, and then he says, stand by, same idea, stand firm. See, the Israelites were ready to forget all the things that God had done for them once they were threatened by the Egyptian army. It seems that all the plagues and all those miracles and everything, all of that went you know, out the back door. Moses' admonition to them was not only to get them to remain where they were physically, in other words, don't throw yourself into the sea out of despair, and don't people do that in the modern age? They're in despair, so what do they do? Maybe they don't throw themselves into the sea, some do, but they take a gun and they harm themselves or they take poison or whatever. You know, he says, hey, stand firm, don't throw yourself into the sea, don't surrender to the Egyptians out of fear, don't give in to the thing, whatever it is, and don't attack the army foolishly. You see, Moses also wanted them to remain focused emotionally as well. When we take our focus off of God and what He has and what He can do for us and we begin to focus only on the threat, only on the problem, I notice one thing in my own life, so long as I'm only focused on the problem, I can't see the solution. It's when I begin to focus on God concerning the problem that the glimmer of solution begins to appear. We lose the one defense mechanism that is absolutely necessary in cases like these, and that's our faith. When we allow ourselves to be destabilized by fear and focus only on the fear and the threat, we begin to lose faith. Sure, we need to do what we know works with our enemy, whatever that is, but we must also remain connected to God by faith in order to survive. Faith in threatening circumstances means that we remain firm in the belief that God will work in and through and for us in order to sustain us during our time of, of trial. No matter what the outcome is, you know, you don't get your way. Does that mean that God has failed you? You don't get your way? The thing you hoped for doesn't come through. Does that mean that God somehow has you know, dropped the ball? You, you, don't get as, you, don't, you don't get well at the moment you had anticipated being well. Does that mean God hates you all of a sudden? The idea of having faith is to, to maintain our faith in God and our trust in Him regardless of the circumstances. It's not just, I believe and I have strong faith uh, you know, when I'm well, when things are going okay, when you know, uh, all my prayers are answered. Faith is not simply tested, but it is created and built and strengthened during the trial. And you know what? God is the one who decides how long that trial is going to be, not us. That's one of the hardest things to, uh, to accept. And so, Faith in threatening circumstances means that we remain firm in the belief that God will work and uh, He will work through us and for us in order to sustain us during our time of trial, no matter what the, what the outcome is. You know how I know I've won the victory? While I'm going through an episode, I'll call it an episode, okay, because sometimes the episode could be illness, but sometimes the episode could be uh, you know, sinfulness. I've fallen back into a sin that I thought I would, you know, what? I did that? I said this? How did I get myself here? 
I know I'm having victory because despite the failings of my body, despite the failings of my will, I'm still hanging on to God in faith. I'll tell you something, it's much harder to believe and to continue to believe while you're failing than while you're winning. I don't know about you guys, but I know in my own life there are long periods of failure <laughs> in between short periods of success. What God wants is that we continue believing, winning, failing, winning, failing, up, down, down, up. No matter what the situation is, God, I continue to believe because my hope rests on your mercy. That's what I hope in. I hope in your mercy. My strength is in the fact that you've made a promise to me. Never mind the promises I've made to myself. Never mind all the, mm -mm, what do we call them at the beginning of the year? You know, the uh, resolutions, thank you. Never mind the resolutions that I've made and not made, or made and not kept. My faith is not based on how well I'm doing. My faith is based on how well the Lord has kept me all the time that I have attempted to follow Him. So don't be afraid, don't give in to the fear. And stand firm, stand firm in your faith. I still believe, Lord, no matter what, I still believe. Beat me, whip me, knock me down, do whatever you want to me, I will not give up what I believe. And then thirdly, so interesting that Moses says this at this particular moment. Could you imagine the noise and the confusion going on? There's a million people plus, there's the army, there's the noise, the sound, the fear, the crying out that says they were crying out to him and all of this. And what does he say in the end? He says, the Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. Some Bibles say, while you keep still. Don't be afraid, stand firm, be still. You know, sometimes we've done all that we can do and our backs are still firmly against the wall. Now in the case of the Israelites, they saw that there was no natural way out of their predicament. There was nothing that they could do or accomplish to get themselves out of the situation that they were in. And so Moses says to them, be still and observe God at work for you. You know, many times we don't allow God to work because we're thrashing about physically and emotionally. We're crying, we're crying out, we're going here and there and oh no, no, no. We miss the opportunity to witness God's glory because we just won't sit still long enough for it to unfold before us. I don't know a lot of passages of scripture by heart. I'm not like uh, our brother Dayton here who knows the book by heart. But there is one that I know by heart. Be still and know that I am God. Psalm 46, 10. And the reason that I've learned that by heart is because I've had to learn it by heart. Not for a test, <laughs> not for an exam. I've had to learn that by heart because of the way that I am. My wife can attest to this. I can't sit still. I don't know about you guys, but my brain never stops. I wish it would sometimes. I wish it would just stop, but it just keeps clicking all the time. Oh, we can do this, oh, we can do that. Poor Marty, you know, every day, every Monday I come in, hey Marty, what's going on? Yeah, yeah, I got an idea. And Marty goes, oh, I can just, I feel the groan. Oh no, we're going, what now? <laughs> you want to buy fans? Oh wait, that's Bob's idea. But, uh, <laughs> I'm not the only one. <laughs> and it was Lise who said that to me. I mean, not from the pulpit, obviously, but she was the one that 
brought me that scripture very early on in our marriage because very early on she learned the kind of person that I was. I mean, I'm kind of mellow now. You, you haven't seen nothing yet. <laughs> Should have seen me when I was 25. Oh my goodness. There was no end to it. Stop already. And she would say, be still and know that I am God. You know, try to, she was in her wisdom giving me something that I could put the brakes on this, this runaway brain. When we are completely defeated and remain still and wait upon the Lord, we are rewarded not only with the end of our situation or a solution, we are rewarded with a glimpse of His glory working on our behalf. That's the reward. We get to see Him. We get to somehow experience Him in action. And that builds our faith. And that faith builds our courage. And that courage helps us to be still even more so. He fights for us but we're often too busy dealing with our fear to notice. But if we are still, we will see that it is He that provides when all is lost. And this is a great moment and a great blessing. The greatest blessing of all is to see God working in your life. That's the greatest blessing of all. No wonder the early Christians and the apostles, no wonder they went to their deaths willingly, not because they liked to suffer, not because they enjoyed pain. They went willingly because they said, where can we go? We've seen the Lord. I mean, they physically seen Him. But all of those since then who have gone to their death as martyrs, do you think they just went to their deaths because they believed in the proposition of Christianity? When you've got somebody pulling your fingernails out or burning you, or cutting off your hand, if your faith is just a bunch of propositions that you memorize, I want to tell you something, your faith goes out the door. You just want the pain to stop. But if you've seen the Lord, if you've watched Him work in your life. You can't deny Him. It's a problem. You know, I wish I could deny Him so you would stop torturing me and, and eventually kill me, but I just can't deny Him. I couldn't convince you that I'm lying. Because I've seen Him work in my life. But so many of us are so busy that we don't see that He's right next to us, taking care of us, working things out in His way. In His way. You know, most of the time we think we can take care of ourselves and we act as if we don't need God. Or perhaps He just provides when we're short you know, we need a little topping up. God will take care of it. But there comes a time in life when we need not just help, we need rescuing, rescuing. Now it could be illness or other grave problems, but when we become like the Israelites in need of more than just mere assistance, we need rescue, it's a 911 situation. This will happen to everyone. And when it does, remember Moses' rescue plan. Don't let fear win. Fear wins when we give in to panic and depression and despair. And don't run away. Denial, anger, rejecting God, turning away from the faith, turning away from the church. This is just what the enemy wants you to do. Don't do it. Stand firm. And thirdly, don't let go. Not your faith and trust, 
No. Let go your solutions and wait for God's solution to appear. And it will. Again, I say the same thing that Marty often says. We never compare notes. We never say, okay, if you preach that, then on Sunday night I'll pick it up and I'll make a great point. Other than maybe the title that I see on the marquee like everybody else, we, we just don't talk about those things. But isn't it wonderful that he talks about waiting <laughs> this morning? And it's as if these two lessons were, could be the same part of a, a book. Who does that? Are we so sophisticated in the world that we're afraid to say, well, God does that? And why wouldn't He do that? We sit here week after week after week, two, three, four times a week, and we pray to God to work in our lives. Please, God, work in my life, do this, oh God, this, and, this. and then when He does, you know, we go, really? We have a mighty God who loves us and jealously guards our lives and our souls. He's for us. He who has already given His Son for our salvation will certainly not spare any other resource to save and to preserve our souls. Faith is continuing to believe this in good times and in bad. The Israelites saw God's solution to their plight as He spread the waters open to save them from the Egyptian army. Wow, what a sight that must have been. And so this evening, the Lord offers the solution to all those who face the enemy of sin and condemnation at judgment. You see, all those without Christ all those people who don't have Christ, they're between a rock and a hard place when it comes to the end of their lives and judgment. You can't get rid of your sins by yourself and you can't stop sinning no matter how hard you try. And all sinners will be judged and condemned. Talk about a rock and a hard place. This presents a real emergency for the one who wants to go to heaven and be right with God. Imagine, even though you know you're a sinner and sinners will be condemned, you can't change the past and you can't stop sinning no matter how hard you try. What a dilemma, what a mess. And so God solves this dilemma and He offers His rescue plan, how? Through the waters of baptism. In Mark 16, 16, Jesus says that he who has believed and has been baptized shall be rescued, <laughs> shall be saved. And in Acts 2.38, Peter says to the crowd, repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So just as the Israelites were saved from physical death by miraculously going through the waters of the Red Sea, sinners today are saved from eternal spiritual death by going through the waters of baptism where the miracle of forgiveness takes place. This is the way of safety for all those who recognize their precarious position as sinners, confess their faith in Jesus Christ and come through the waters of baptism to a place where sin and condemnation can no longer threaten your life. Never again will you be threatened. So, if you need to implement Moses' rescue plan to deal with problems in your life, we encourage you to come forward for prayer and for ministry. And since you're sitting up closer, it's a less walk, you know, just a few steps down. And if you also need Christ's rescue plan to deal with your sins, then please come for baptism as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.